My name is Eric Williams. I represent the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Uh, we have received an application through our uh, annual solicitation of acquisitions grants for the potential uh, purchase of the subject property. Uh, and part of our process uh, when we get applications for acquisitions is to hold a public hearing like this to get uh, public input on the process. And this application uh, came in in October. That's when our annual solicitation cycle is. And we have a fairly lengthy process to vet the applications that come to us. And so this public hearing is one piece of several that are important for us to bring this information to our board. Uh, and so I should make a comment about who we are. Uh, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, or OWEB as we're called for short, uh, is a state agency. It's a non-regulatory agency uh, that was set up by referendum and enshrined in the Constitution. And our mission is to protect and restore watersheds and natural habitats that support thriving economies and local communities. Uh, we do have the co-chair of our board here today, Dan Thorndike, who I'd like to introduce. It's from Ashland. Well, Pleased to see all the interest. I mean, we're usually, oh, what? That's <laughs> 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 great. Um, and so the process that I was uh, describing includes, in addition to the public hearing, we do, uh, we do our due diligence in terms of a soundness review uh, to deal with property title issues. We do an ecological analysis of the property to determine the ecological values there to see if it's worth our investment of these funds. Um, and we do an organizational capacity review of the organization who's applied to us to make sure that they've got uh, the long-term capacity to deal with sometimes complex property management issues over the long term. So all of those pieces get compiled into an evaluation that we'll present to our board in April. And that's when the board will make the decision about whether or not they want to fund uh, this particular application as well as the other applications that have come to us uh, through our acquisition program. So welcome, come on in. What we'd like to do today is we're going to have um, Craig Harper from Southern Oregon Land Conservancy give you a summary of their application and this proposal to talk about uh, why they uh, filed the application and the benefits that they see uh, to it. And then what I'm going to try to do, it's a large group, I'm going to try to do this the best I can. What I'd like to do is have a facilitated discussion, which I'll go through with you and try to organize your comments on benefits that you see to the application and concerns that you have, plus any other specific messages that you would like me to bring back to our board. Um, so that's how uh, we're planning to have it go today. If people do, when we get to that facilitated discussion, if you do want your comments recorded, I have a recorder and I'm happy to turn that on. I'll also mention that we have uh, comment forms there at the front. We will be accepting written comments through April 12th. So if you need time to reflect on what you hear today and you want to uh, compose something in writing to us, you have a couple of months to, to do that. And we bring that feedback to our board uh, who will be, as I said, meeting in April. Um, to make decisions on this application before us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig for an overview of the proposal. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, as Eric said, my name is Craig Harper. I'm with the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, and I want to thank everyone for coming today. It's great to have some of these interest in this project. I'm going to give a brief, a brief overview of the property and the grant application. And talk a little bit about, you know, why we're so interested in acquiring this property. Um, the 352-acre property is located, well, here's a map, and it's hard to see from the back of the room, but uh, the property is located just downstream from Shady Cove, about four miles downstream from Shady Cove, just upstream of Dot Bridge, Highway 234. And here's Eagle Point, Bedford, Table Rocks, that kind of orient you. The site itself, is an incredible, extraordinarily diverse property. It has a 16-acre island. It has over two miles of stream bank of the Rogue River flowing past. The Rogue River flows from north to south here. Here's Dodge Bridge County Park just to the south of it. Uh, it's got this 140-acre floodplain forest that is an active floodplain. The river flows through this uh, floodplain at 
you know, pretty, uh, not, not real high blood, blood levels. Uh, it has vernal pools, chaparral, oak woodlands. Um, there's an old historical residence that was built in about 1922 that's right here on the banks of the river. If you float the river, you may have seen that, that residence. It's still in very good shape uh, there in its original state. And that's a photo of it right there, yeah. Actually, that photo was taken, we think, in the 1940s, and if you look at this old car, you might be able to help me uh, identify <laughs> what year that was exactly. But late that was, uh, the trees have grown up quite a bit more than that now. And, uh, anyway, uh, the habitat there is also demonstrated on this map, if you get a chance later to look at this more closely, it shows the different types of habitat that I, that I described. And here's that active floodplain, how it flows um, through the property, kind of beginning up in areas like this, and flows down through this low-lying area. And that's really one of the unique things about this property is that that active floodplain. That's you know a lot of floodplains now are disconnected from the river, and during flooding and during times when there's a high flow, fish have a hard time getting into places where they can you know have ref refuge from the floodwaters, and that's one of the really extraordinary things about this property. So. The Southern Oregon Land Conservancy applied to OWEB for $1.4 million to purchase this property, which we're calling the Rogue River Preserve. Um, SOLC, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, is Oregon's oldest regional land trust. We have uh, 38 years of conservation success working with jurisdictions, private landowners, and the communities we serve, which are uh, in southwest Oregon. We have land, more land conserved in Oregon than any other regional land trust, uh, encompassing nearly 10,000 acres. And we are experienced stewards of con conserved land. That's a point I really want to hit on. So why are we so interested in owning and managing this preserve? Our goal, and I'll read this word for word, is to conserve the property as one large intact natural area that provides ecological and public benefits in perpetuity. And that last phrase is important. We're, we really want to protect this forever. The property, uh, so far, you know, the property has been well managed. It's ecologically healthy, and it's in a relatively natural, undisturbed, relatively natural, undisturbed condition. We plan to enhance that condition through noxious weed removal, uh, meadow enhancement, faster enhancement, fire resistance, riparian protection and restoration, and other activities. Um, development pressure on the property is really high. It would be extremely desirable for residential development. It could hold uh, potentially up to six home sites. Right now it has that one, that one home that I mentioned. So protecting this exceptional rare property is a once in a lifetime opportunity that our organization is ready to embrace. Southern Oregon Land Conservancy has been talking with the landowners, the MacArthur family since 1993. They are descendants of Robert Rule, who is the owner and publisher, uh, editor of the Mail, editor of Mail Tribune, and uh, he purchased the property in 1943. Uh, the home was built in 1922 or around that, that date, and as I mentioned, is still in really good shape. Today, the property is owned by Robert Rule's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and none of the family lives in the area currently, but they do have a, uh, a caretaker, and he's here today, actually. Uh, in recent years, we, we had spoken with the family about uh, placing a conservation easement on the property, and, but in 1914, or excuse me, not quite that late, <laughs> 2014, they decided to sell the property and they accepted our offer to purchase it. So although our primary goal is conservation and enhancement, we foresee many potential limited public uses and benefits including fishing, hiking, birding, sightseeing, photography, education, special events, and volunteer opportunities. The preserve could also serve as a model for restoration and scientific research in this region due to its relatively undisturbed character. So in conclusion, the Oregon, uh, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy has an option to purchase agreement with the family through December 2016 and the OWIP grant would provide a huge boost to our efforts to purchase and care for this magnificent property. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. All right, and as I mentioned, what I'd like to do is have a facilitated conversation about the proposal that's before you.
And given that we have a lot of people here, we schedule it for an hour. I'm willing to stay as long as it takes, but to try and, and respect each other's time, uh, if we could, at least in the first go round, um, limit your comments to phrases that I'll jot down on these pieces of paper so that we can get uh, as uh, detailed and accurate uh, a picture of public comment and input that I can then bring back and present to the board as possible. So, as I mentioned, we'll uh, first start with what benefits you see from this proposal, and then we'll talk about what concerns you have about the proposal. So, let's kick it off with benefits. Um, who would like to start? Raise your hand. Uh, do you want us to introduce ourselves? Or just sure, if you could just state your name. Sure. Uh, if you want to state who you represent, that's fine too. <coughs> My name is Paul Hill, and uh, I am the trustee of Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, and I'm also on the advisory board for the National Trust for Public Land, and I've been involved in environmental activities and fish and wildlife protection for over 10 years. Um, this, to me, is a unique, biologically diverse property in this area. It, it's, uh, as Craig said, got some really interesting and very unusual aspects of flooded plain being one, but the different <coughs> diversity to me is really uh, key. Second thing is it, it's almost unique in that it's been preserved in pretty much its natural state for 75 to 100 years. It, it just hasn't changed, and you don't find many pieces of land this big that are that way. Um, third thing I, I think that's a real benefit is it's privately owned now. If it's not uh, acquired by SOLC, the very likely possibility is it will be bought privately for development and it will become residential and there will be zero public access. And Craig mentioned the uh, benefits that, that would accrue in terms of allowing uh, a certain amount of public access to people for recreational but educational as well. And I think those are tremendous benefits which this acquisition would allow. Um, so in summary, I, I feel like it's a unique opportunity to, to for the benefit of this whole community uh, and the surrounding areas, protect something that is, is special and let the public enjoy it, appreciate it, and make a positive use of it. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Benefits that you see from the application. Yes, sir. My name's Jack Williams. I'm a senior scientist with Cloud Unlimited uh, here in, in Medford. And in addition to the to very good comments that, that have been made, I think one of the really important aspects of this property is, is that it, it, because it is in such good condition, uh, especially relative to a lot of uh, the riparian land along the um, uh, upper road, that it, it really does provide a, a very good benchmark in terms of understanding um, where we should be restoring and how we, we might restore some of the lands that are degraded in this area. So this idea of, of sort of a benchmark or some sort of a template for restoration and, and future management for other lands along the road, I think is a really important aspect of this property. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Eugene Weir. I'm a restoration project manager for the Freshwater Trust and I am charged with managing programs for the City of Medford, its thermal credit program, as well as Bureau of Reclamation's biological opinion work here in the basin that supports our treatment plants operation in Medford, as well as our irrigation system for the entire valley. And in doing that work, one of the key things, as Jack mentioned, is reference conditions. If we don't know what we're trying to get to, then we're just sort of shooting in the dark here with our prescriptions and with our projections of the potential benefits. This site, uh, you know, I've spent hundreds of hours in searching around on the ground and using remote sensing to find the best, most intact habitat in the road to look at. This site represents, uh, in my opinion, the best that we have in this section of the river above Grants Pass, essentially. And we would like to continue to use this to learn about riparian health and how we might get back to these types of conditions. The fact that it's connected to the floodplain means that it's still dynamic, it's still alive, it's still evolving in a way that we want to move back for. So I see this site, uh, preservation of the site is a key piece of maintaining a place that we can study and have a, tra a trajectory to head towards with our restoration work. Thank you. So I'll hand over here. Back there. I'm Randy White, uh, District Manager with Jackson Solar Conservation District. And I'm speaking on behalf of our board last night. Board of, last night approved my my being here and speaking on their behalf. And 
Jackson Stormwater Conservation District uh, is in the community working with both private and public landowners, uh, helping them improve the stewardship on their properties. And from the board standpoint, there's a couple of things that they like about the acquisition of this property uh, by Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. And the first one is that it helps keep that property as a working land property um, and keeps it from further development. Um, as, as we work with a lot of landowners, we see a lot of the uh, mismanagement ends up being on some of these smaller properties. So if we can keep these larger intact properties uh, functioning the way they should be, uh, that is a giant benefit uh, to the community. Um, the other thing that we look at it from a standpoint of, of we, we pass on uh, science-based research to our landowners uh, in the implementation process. So the fact that we would have a property like this to be able to do research on it, but also use it as a demonstration site uh, and, and probably, um, again speaking on behalf of the board, we do a lot of educational work both with adults and youth. This could be a great educational venue, uh, particularly for some projects that we're working on is our forest range day camp. It's a five day camp. It would be fantastic if we had a place that we could go to and have all these different habitat types that uh, these young people, fourth through seventh graders, could get out there and actually see and have hands-on experience uh, with stewardship, uh, on the ground stewardship. And we also are looking at trying to put on a regional, what we call an Envirothon contest. And it's a one day contest. Uh, and the folks that, that would be from the Southwest, they'd have teams coming in that uh, would research and, and put together uh, and test it on different things. This year, we're actually looking at invasive species and how to uh, make sure that we can help control and maintain uh, our sites so that we are, you know, so that they're not uh, being inundated with invasive species. And so this would be a perfect place to be able to take uh, these kids and, and have this contest. Uh, the winner from that contest would go on to the state level, and if they were to win there, they'd actually be able to go on to national level. So it's a great opportunity, again, for youth to be able to, to uh, get out and get some hands-on experience because they're the ones that are going to be making the decisions for us in the very short term here. And being able to do this is, is a gigantic benefit. Thank you. Um, before we get the next hand, there is one chair here if those in the hallway would like to see if anyone wants a chair. It's free. And there's some space you might let There's a little bit of standing hallway. space along oh. the wall back mm -hmm. here, too. So come on in. <coughs> Stand um, yes, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm Tom Atzett. I've been area ecologist down here since 1977 for the, the Forest Service and the ON. And I've seen a lot of this area, and I have one point to, to share with you. Uh, in 2005, uh, Jerry McLeod and I uh, walked just about every river in this basin, from Crater Lake all the way to the coast, and we read the Watershed Council reports stack that high because we wanted to know uh, what condition this basin was in. And just like everybody said, like Jack, and, and I'd like to recheck some of these marks that have already been checked. Uh, when I looked at the condition of these watersheds that Jerry and I found, there was one that was really, really outstanding. And so that's what's been said. Boy, I totally agree. And, and the idea that it could be a benchmark. I used to put in all of the research natural areas for the experiment station as part of my job here. And this would be a perfect area because it is unfettered relatively. And when we look at the eight basins that we looked at and about 80 streams that Jerry and I looked at, it just is outstanding. And so I just like to, again, recheck some of the things that have already, already been said. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm um, Linda Kreisberg. I'm with the local Audubon Society, affiliated with the National Audubon. And I just want to mention the extraordinary diversity of bird life on this property because of the extraordinary diversity of habitat there. And uh, we really look forward to cooperating with 
Southern Oregon Land Conservancy in the future in both conservation and education. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Patrick Duffy, and I, I live on the road and I have for the past 25 years. Um, but I was born and raised in Montana, and, and I just want to speak very briefly to the, the danger of taking things for granted. You know, all my childhood uh, I took for granted living in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in the 40s and 50s, and then moved to California and got a rude awakening. Uh, chose a place to live the rest of my life, which was the Rogue River Valley here. Um, and every day, uh, my wife and I reconfirm our attitude that we cannot take any of this for granted. That change is inevitable, but we do have a choice as to the pace of that change and as to the uh, diversity of what those changes will be. Um, and along with everything else, I look around this room and we need younger people involved in this type of uh, oversight. <laughs> no offense, everybody. <laughs> But it's very seldom that I have the most hair and the darkest. Uh, but to me, one of the beauties of this, besides everything else that's been said, it was touched on briefly, but this is a unique piece of property that is city adjacent. There is such an opportunity for young people, maybe not people that are determined to become naturalists or, or saviors of the environment, but school children who can come on a one-time basis and experience something that they would have to travel hundreds of miles to find. And it is city adjacent. It is school bus adjacent. It is right there. They can be there and be home by lunch. And they will be educated for the rest of their lives, and they will be dedicated small pieces of determination for the future of the Rogue Valley and for the future of properties like this, wherever we may find. So uh, I really want to uh, put whatever emphasis I can and my wife and myself, uh, which is the reason we joined the Conservancy in the first place. Uh, very briefly, I wrote a letter to Miss Alicia Rule when we bought our property here because we saw elk herds dancing across the meadows across the property. <laughs> and I thought, this can never go away. And I wrote a letter saying, which is a very presumptuous, but I said, if you ever want to sell that property, Please contact me because I'm determined to keep this area as much in its natural habitat as possible. And she wrote back a very nice letter saying, it's in a trust. Our family determines to make this you know, in perpetuity uh, its natural state. And then uh, last year we saw in the paper that it was of necessity being sold, which is why we became involved. But this is extremely important. This is not mildly important. This is extremely important, but I think primarily for its educational potential for the future. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other hands? Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Randy Frick. I've worked as a fish biologist in this area for about 40 years, uh, 15 in the South Umpqua and 25 here, and we've rafted by this property for at least the last 30 years. This is a unique uh, opportunity. I was a high school biology teacher before I worked for the Forest Service, and uh, kids here would get a model of what things probably would look like if they were unfettered and in healthy condition. That's, that's a priceless thing for people. They will keep that visual in their minds the rest of their life once they see. There's a lot of biology going on here. There's eagle nests, osprey nests, lots of pond turtles, which are sensitive for the state. There's a small stream with coho salmon that's, that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, plus coho salmon in the side channels in the area that's inundated. So this is a very unique piece of property, and uh, you have a time-tested conservation organization that would manage it. So there really are a lot of pluses for this. Great, thank you. Yes. I'm Molly Morrison with the Nature Conservancy, and uh, the Nature Conservancy really strongly supports the acquisition of this property by Southern Oregon Land Conservancy for all the reasons that people have already spoken to. Um, the amazing floodplain gallery forest, the connectivity between the river and the uplands, uh, the high plant wildlife diversity. It's really amazing. I've been lucky to be out there a few times, uh, actually just last week with volunteers, so taking members of the public out to do some fairy shrimp surveys on the property. They had a great time. They learned so much. Thank you, Craig, for letting us go out. Um, but I also want to point out that this property is part of a network of conservation properties in that general area, so it's 
close by, uh, less than a mile away from one of our conservation properties, the um, Rogue River Plains Preserve, which is about 125 acres. It's close to the Table Rocks, which is about 5,000 acres of protected land, um, near Denman Wildlife Area, near Oregon State Park. So it's really cool the way it just fits in nicely with this um, nice array of, of conservation properties in the public. Um, we don't know what's ahead with changing climate, but I think the more we can provide some room for things to move around and find some different little habitat niches, the better off we'll be. So. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sue Raleigh, and um, I've been in the Valley for nearly 40 years now. Uh, I transferred here with the Forest Service. I worked extensively as a soil scientist and many different forest planner, district ranger, and I retired from a uh, position of the interagency liaison between the Applegate Partnership and the community at large, the interagency um, of the BLM and the Forest Service, trying to encourage more collaboration, both scientific and, and in our involvement with the community. Um, through that, a web was created in those early days, working with the governor and the Applegate uh, Partnership. And I want to thank you um, as part of the staff and, and, uh, and the capacity of OWEB to make significant changes in our state has just been excellent. And I really appreciate that. Um, I think I want to also speak to the benefit of this land being managed by the Conservancy because I was on the Board of Directors in the early 80s, just after it, its inception as the first um, land trust in the state. And through that, I've seen a tremendous change over time. Uh, after I retired from the Forest Service, I also worked briefly as the first monitor and coordinator and, uh, and then helped facilitate the conservation plan. And I, I see that the, what's happened in the last um, uh, 10 to 15 years has been very significant. And what we've gained now it is absolutely a sustainable organization, I believe, that is one that has the capacity through not only the fabulous staff that we have on board, very skilled, scientifically oriented staff, but also the board members who who allow us to extend our, our capacity, both uh, with financial understanding, uh, understanding how to sustain an organization in a healthy way. And I think also what we have is the extensive volunteer cadre with people like Randy Frick and, and, and others. Of course, Tom is on the board still, I think. Um, but many, many scientists throughout the valley who are thrilled to work in such a win-win, you know, situation. So many times as a scientist, as a specialist, you know, we've been, you know, in kind of a conflict situation sometimes with what it, we're trying to do to protect but also balance. But this is really a unique opportunity to, to be able to place such a rare and special property in the hands of an organization that has the capacity to continue to not only protect it, but to manage it and to restore it and to open it for these fabulous education opportunities that have been mentioned. So from a capacity standpoint, I think it's significant Thank you. and unique. And it's the last chance we're going to get. <laughs> Other hands? Yeah. Well, I hold, uh, my name is Pat Acklin. Um, I'm a current board president for the Land Conservancy. I'm also a semi-retired uh, professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at SOU. And I just want to uh, check, as Tom said, the remarks that Sue made about the capacity of the organization. Of course, as president of the board, that would be my opinion, but I need to share with you that I wouldn't be the president of the board if we didn't have such a competent staff and a history that shows uh, growth and uh, in many areas of management in a nonprofit. Uh, and when I write to people and ask them to make their time and treasure available to us, I'm always sure to say that because it truly is a fine organization. Uh, with my professor's hat on, I again could check the off the many things that have been offered to you, but my favorite thing about it as a person who taught geomorphology is that it truly is an ideal cross-section of a stream valley and a stream in the middle reaches. It has two stream terraces. Stream terraces are the most difficult things to get students to be able to understand because they're often uh, subtle landform 
and frequently cloaked with trees. Or houses. <laughs> <laughs> well, and houses in the modern world, yeah. making them difficult to observe. So uh, I would second the motion that this is going to be a great outdoor laboratory for students, and not just young students, but university students need to have an outdoor laboratory as well. So uh, again, thanks for the time that you've put in to have this public hearing, and uh, anyway, good luck in the process. Thank you. I had a hand over here. Yeah, my name is Karen Smith, and I second everything that everybody said here. Um, I, I would just like to say that I'm a fifth generation resident of the Valley, and I've seen a fair amount of degradation in some of the areas that I enjoyed most as a kid. Um, I also worked for many years on the Bear Creek Greenway project. I think we have an opportunity here to create legacy for ourselves where we set aside something that's really special in urban settings, areas with, that have great pressure for urban development. That is a bit of what used to be. And so I really heartily encourage the OWE board to consider this application. Thank you. Other hands? Yes, sir. Well, I, uh, I see you have nothing on the right side, so I'm going to... We're getting a, to that. I'm going to take a shot here. First of all, uh, uh, people look at land differently, especially in the state. I grew up in New York City. I came west, and I wound up out here in the Rogue Valley, and I think the Rogue Valley is a beautiful place to live. But there's a lot of people that have lived in this valley who look at land differently. They've made their living from the land. They, they, uh, they, they, they respect the land, but they don't look at the land as a shrine, like they've got to worship at it. They have a realistic view. They've raised families. They've brought up, they've brought up their children here. And, and, uh, I really think if you're looking for stakeholders uh, to give opinions, and I think every if you buy land, you have the right to do whatever you want with that land. But what I hear here is like, this is a stepping stone to, to doing other things, and I'm thinking to myself, no it isn't. You've got to represent all of the people. You're a state agency, and uh, you're representing a certain mindset which is not in representative of all the people in Oregon and in the Rogue Valley. Uh, there's, uh, this has been a timber-based economy for a long, long time. And, uh, and there's a lot of people that would have different opinions. Now me, I grew, I grew up in New York City. I didn't see any, uh, the only trees I ever saw was when I went to a local park or I went to Central Park. And, and, I, and I agree that there's a lot of natural beauty in this country and and should be respected but but you know people are important too and people have always made their living from the land the land is an important source of wealth and we can't just preserve southern oregon like it's a natural park i mean what are we what, are, what are the people that don't agree with you what are we the animals that run around in the park you could watch us through a sight glass no this has to be fair. If you're going to look at how this works, make it fair to everybody that lives here. Get other stakeholders. Don't pack the room with people who want to make a shrine out of this land. You know, uh, I personally love the land. I work. I'm a landscaper. I, I work in the soil every day. But I know my place, and I know... I know what's important, and then you you know there's the there has to be fairness in your decisions because you if you're a state agency you're representing all the people of this state not just one particular group one particular mindset so uh, so take that into your consideration I I uh, I, I wish you would. Okay. We have transitioned to concerns. I think we got a good list of <laughs> benefits. So others who have concerns about the project. Yes, sir. My name is Robert Crowley, and I'm a property owner down by 
John Jay Estates, and I want to register my being in opposition to this whole thing. I can tell you why. As far as your point goes to the uniqueness of the land, all right, legally, any piece of property, including any rural property, such as what I own as a homeowner, is unique. That's what gets you into equity for any kind of realty dispute is the uniqueness of the land. And you can make that argument and you can make any kind of geological structure true of anything up and down this valley, including people's ranches, their farms, or even their homes. That's point one. So to make that argument that, well, this particular piece is super unique, it's true. It's a valid statement. But that's true of any piece of property up and down the river, any piece of property you want in back of the Applegate, or anywhere else in this county, or any other county in the state. So that's one thing off the bat. The second thing out of this, again, and I want to oops, reference my <laughs> we can chalk it up to New York values. Uh, it's the fact that we have, and I have, ever since they removed uh, the John Day Dam and the other dams have experienced an ongoing siege from this entire movement that basically, one way or the other, from Shady Cove all the way down to the Pacific Ocean, this river, this valley, these properties are going to be a wild scenic designation. And this is one more step in that direction that you have to piece all these properties in. How that impacts the average property owner, myself included, and the reason I say this, I've been through I don't know how many of these meetings. Uh, some of them have noticed. This one didn't have any notice of property owners that I'm aware of. We did send it to all the neighboring property owners. Just the neighboring. And they put it in the newspaper. Out that. We put it in the newspaper. But a lot of these things in there with this, when you get down to the actual <coughs> administrative aspects of this whole program, you're getting entities in the government, the BLM, the Department of Parks, the Department of State Lands, et cetera, et cetera. And you're getting in on the property owners, say a rancher or somebody like that, all of these administrators now going on to their property saying, well, wait a minute, you know, your practice watering the cattle here or plowing up this field is incompatible with what's going on over the hill. And so what you end up with is known as bureaucratic blighting of that title. What happens to them is you have a property owner and their property is worth X in today's market value. You bring the bureaucracy into it, and they start doing this, that, and the other, and ordering this and one thing or another. And your ability to sell that property to somebody else is diminished. Who wants to actually come in and get title to a land, and you have all of a sudden these other entities, including non-governmental organizations, coming in and saying, you can't do this, you got to do that, we're doing this, you have to do that, gee, if you don't do that, we're going to bring a suit against you, blah, blah, blah. Nobody wants that. So your ability to say, hey, I'm getting tired of the program, I want to sell my property and move to wherever, okay, that is diminished because the only entities you can actually sell the property to ends up as one of these NGOs or government agencies. I saw this at the tail end of this wild scenic river designation. You should see the contracts you get forced into when your property is within the conservation area, as it were. Uh, it's not pretty. It really isn't. Mr. Myers had that on his show a number of months back of one beleaguered property owner. And this is going on all throughout the West. So I'm looking at all of this, and I see this whole thing, and, you know, it just strikes me as, uh, as a citizen here and a property owner that, frankly, my whole existence are these meetings 
and driveway dodgeball of one state agency or federal agency or some other group with the stakeholder, and I call it stakeholder scam because you sure don't have any property owners as stakeholders, I'll guarantee you that. It's all these little groups, and they go behind closed doors, and they have collaborative government, and the next thing you know, a surprise here. Here's, here's what we're going to be doing. So this entire movement to turn the river and the valley and the county and all these things into this wild scenic <coughs> designation, uh, I'm opposed to it because the spate and switch you're going to get on this as you put these pieces together is you're going to get pristine of the wilderness area superimposed on developed properties, even municipalities. And Mr. Wyden and Mr. Merkley have got a bill that seeks to do just that in the Congress floating around in there. So that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Other concerns? Okay. Sir. I'm Al Buck. I live in Eagle Point. Uh, and I have made several trips through this wonderful spot that we're looking at today. I, over the, my life of my career, I have had 25 years working with conservation. The first was with the National Park Service when I helped to develop the, the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That's a national program. And a couple of years later, I was told to do the same thing for the Wild and Scenic Rivers program. I have, I have spent 15, I, I, I helped to develop the original plan, and I have spent 15 years working on that plan. When I moved here in 2001, I, I got in contact with the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. And they accepted me, and I've been with that group for 14 years, and uh, from what a group that is, wonderful. Great job, Diane, and your crew. <laughs> <laughs> so I think based on what you hear what I'm here hearing today from me, I think we should go ahead and you should give us the, the grant that we're asking for. <laughs> <laughs> and let, let's do this. Let's work together and get it and do it and do it now. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that's a benefit. Please, please, refrain, please refrain from applause. Not, this is not that kind of meeting. Um, seriously, folks, I want to keep it um, to just the facts and just people's input. Part of it is he's Appreciate 99 that. years old. It's just amazing. <laughs> that is worthy of applause. Yeah. 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 However, yeah. we can applaud that later. <laughs> sir. Hello, my name is Gordon Chalstrom. I have a place on the Rogue River. And I just want to say, you know, uh, through the removal of the Savage Rapids Dam to allow fish to pass up unencumbered, it cost my property 10 150 foot tall cottonwood trees. I had a canopy that covered, I have an acre and a half of fringe along the river. I had a canopy that covered one end of the other. But because the water level dropped over six feet, those trees could not recover and, and the roots couldn't get to the water. And I didn't see any conservation people out there helping me buck those trees up, cut them down, or do anything. That being said, sir, I believe that if the water conservation, if these conservationists want this 352 acres, put your money where your mouth is. Don't be using my taxpayer money. I think you should put your money up there and buy it. And if you all get together, it wouldn't take a heck of a lot. But my taxes have gone up to the point where I cannot live the standard of living that I used to. You know, and I need some relief. Property taxes are going through the roof. Nothing is going down in this state except property values and our rights. I expect our rights to be maintained, my property rights to be maintained, and I want my taxes reduced and continuing to give away money for projects like this that the majority of Oregon taxpayers do not believe in is a waste and a fiduciary wrong. And that needs to stop. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Other hands? 
Please, please refrain, refrain from applause. Other hand. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm John Ward with the Rope Fly Fishers Conservation Chair, and I wanted to uh, speak for the fish. They really appreciate the waterfront property that's been provided for 70 some odd years or more uh, in that upper road. It's really important to them. Um, the Chinook, especially in the six miles below Shady Cove, uh, that's prized property. They want 60% of the spring Chinook to spawn in there. Well, let's try to make that possible. They were here long before we were. I'm trying to see that they stay there much longer than I'm going to be here. That'd be great. I'd love to have youngsters come and see what uh, you can see in the fall out there now. So between the teachers who could come out and learn uh, information that they can pass on to the students when they come out and visit, then maybe they'll uh, get a different slant on what Oregon can be than what it has been. And I appreciate very much what the uh, owners of the land over these years have uh, done patiently. Thank you. Other concerns? It the occurred problems? to me that the gentleman who spoke recently hadn't had opportunity to sign in and that you might want their names and contact information for the record. Thank you. There's, oh, there's only two spots left. Thank you. Thank you. If you haven't signed in, we do have more spots in the back, too. There's an empty sheet here. Thanks. Yes, sir. I'm Jeff O'Kane. Um, the, the negative comments that have been made it focused on the rights of private property owners, and certainly we all respect those rights. But I think you're overlooking something here. First, the seller of the MacArthur family uh, is, in fact, a private landowner, exercising their private right to sell to whom they want, and they've asked that the property maintained in, in, in perpetuity. Secondly, I think by preserving properties like this, uh, you're enhancing the value of all of the surrounding properties. So this gentleman here is a landowner upstream or downstream. If this property is preserved, it's probably going to, over time, enhance the value of your own personal holdings. And as to whether it's appropriate to use public money uh, to help fund this, this acquisition, if this property is developed, it, it's going to be destroyed permanently forever. Okay? And there will be all manner of collateral damage downstream. But if the property, if, if the grant application uh, is approved and SOLC is able to buy this property, they will in fact preserve public opportunities to enjoy and use this property. Furthermore, just by preserving habitat of this quality, you're going to enhance uh, overall quality of life for the, the entire surrounding watershed forever. And I think that uh, is a lot more important than any individual property owner's current right to do what he wants with his own property because it has effects on everybody around him. Thank you. Other concerns? Yes, ma'am. I'm Cindy Clark, and I'm a private property owner, not on the Rogue River, but I do have one way to put so I'm pretty well acquainted with taking care and being a good land conservationist. And I know I'm not in the path of all this, but I've seen plenty of property, private property being taken out of private ownership. And I figure one of these days, it's going to be my turn. People are knocking on my door saying, we need to preserve the water going through your land. And all the causative things that they've listed that this property we're just speaking of today, that they've listed exist, and they have existed under private property ownership. spoke of the uniqueness of the property. Well, my property is unique too. Every piece of property has its own uniqueness. And the way I see it, I own it, you want it, 
and you're going to bully me into it or you're going to steal it from me by using public money. And I don't like it. I'm very opposed. Because it just sets precedence or it's following a precedence that's already been set to take private property out of private ownership. And I don't know why any of those things on your pro side can't exist in a private property ownership. Not one of them. Thank you. Other concerns? I'd like to make one more comment. May I? You may. Okay. Somebody's concerned about using tax dollars. We're not using a penny of tax dollars. It's all donations. So get that through your head. I, I will add a clarifying point. And I should have I should have mentioned this in my introduction. I apologize. Uh, OWEB does get revenue for um, our acquisitions program through the lottery. So, so these are lottery funds. They're not uh, income tax dollars or anything like that. They are lottery revenues. Yeah, I just want to clarify that too, because not not speaking to this. I'm co-chair, or a private citizen here, property owner, all that stuff. Um, but but our funding is the agency itself is not even funded through general fund. It's it's lottery funding, and also there's money that comes from the federal government through Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund. That's our two primary funding minor amount of money from the salmon license plates you see but that's kind of drop in the bucket but we're, we're not a tax funded agency and in terms of support the last ballot measure that basically allowed that constitutionally created the agency and that funding source went by 70 percent statewide so there was strong strong support for the use of those lottery and the mission, for this purpose. And the mission of OWEB. Yeah, so anyway, that's just to clarify that it's not, I, I totally agree, if it's just tax money as such, um, that, well, that's a different question, but it's not. I mean, if the money wasn't spent on this, it could be spent on schools. Who knows? Well, I mean, that's, that's who knows, but the, again, yeah. there was a ballot public measure. funds, as this one yeah. said over right. yes. yes. That is correct. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Dan Kellogg, and I've been involved with the Land Conservancy for 20 years at least, and up. Uh, I just, I guess, uh, this is more of a positive, but I see this, this money issue is actually an opportunity for the public because um, the OWEB funds are only, can are be less than 50% of the funds needed to purchase this property. And this gives an opportunity for public members to support this project and invest in the, these conservation values. And it, it will be uh, privately owned land belonging to a conservation organization. So. This is all uh, <coughs> compatible with pro private property rights, I guess. That's a good point, I think, to Eric. It's, it's a, it seems to be a sense that this would be publicly owned and under public administration. So it wouldn't be That's correct. The, the owner would be, is, is a private owner. It's a private owner. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a couple questions. Number one, I've never been involved with the land conservation group, and I'm really not aware of, other than the Table Rocks, what lands that you all own in this general area, and what is the public access to them, and uh, what's the public access going to be to this piece? I'll let uh, Craig Harper address uh, the other Southern Oregon Land Conservancy holdings. Or, or did I? Hi, I'm Diane Garcia, and I'm the director hi, at the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. Um, so I, I'd like to answer your question. Sure. Um, we own one other property. Uh, it's a small 30-acre piece of property out in the town of Williams. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have um, really access, so it doesn't have, uh, it's not open to the public. Um, and the other properties that you mentioned, like Table Rocks, we are not the Nature Conservancy. Okay. They're a different, totally different, separate nonprofit organization. So we don't own the Table Rocks. Um, we don't own any other property other than the one 30 acres out in the town of Williams. I ride horses for fun, and we used to be able to ride up on the table rocks, and, and we used to go, sometimes there was a large group, sometimes there were just a few people. 
but we always rode on the road and we never cut corners. We've been riding in the outback for a long time and we know how to do it and treat the land well. My problem with these ventures is that everything always gets closed off. You can't ride your horse up the table rocks through John Day Ranch like you used to be able to. So our, our goal right now is this property has no public access. And right. you know, if it were sold to any other individual, it probably would never have public access. I understand There's that. never been public access. If it was private property. So our goal is to really to have some public access so that people can come out onto the property, you know, not only youth, but also adults, whether you're taking a hike or you want to go out and do some birding or just watch the river flow by. Um, that's our I goal. Just, I live to just south that, there. That kind of benefit. So we no. hope that we can do that. You hope, or is that going to be something that's going to be written down it's in, somewhere? It's written down. It's in our management plan. It's in our application to OI. That, that is part of our process that we require. If we invest in a property, we require a management plan that clearly spells out issues such as access, what uh, <coughs> types of management would be happening on the property. That, that will all be spelled out uh, as part of this process. Cool. When do you have your meetings? Pardon me? When do you have your meetings? Our board will be deciding on this application in April. Uh, well, the board meets quarterly. It has a different schedule. You should check our website. It's all there. Okay. okay. Our, our board meets quarterly uh, at different locations around the state. Uh, the location where the April board meeting is, Dan, can you help me out? I can't remember. I forgot what <laughs> <laughs> it is. Right? It is on our website. Whatever is after McMinnville. Yeah. Right. right. I'd yes. like to just add a little bit to Diane's explanation <coughs> to say that we do hold easements on properties that are publicly owned. We own, uh, we have easements that protect conservation values on two parks in the city of Ashland and in, all in the Jacksonville Woodlands where there are extensive hiking trails. Uh, the other thousands of acres are conservation easements to protect conservation values that are on private properties that right. have been arranged by the private owners right. with the conservation organization. And most of those don't allow public access because yeah, they're privately owned. Right. So there's those several ways in which we hold Right, so just because property. you have a conservation easement doesn't mean that you own the property. Right. right. And it also doesn't mean, it, we negotiate with owners just as we did with this ownership to protect those things that are on value. Well aware of For one your person, they might want to. They might have a forest, and they. Uh, we have management plans that allow uh, sustainable use forestry, and we also have easements that allow agricultural uses to continue right. as they have in the past. I just felt those things needed to be said to cool. so that folks in the room understood the organization a little better. Thank you. I have a hand over here, sir. <coughs> My name is Lee Weber. I speak to the point of public access. As far as I know, I've, I've fished over a long time, drift down it. And uh, as far as I know, from uh, the boat ramp up there at Casey Park down to where this one is at, at Roger, at uh, Dodge Bridge, there's one. Other than the boat ramps, of course. So there's one at Casey Park, there's one at Elk Creek, there's one down at Shady Cove, and then there's one down at the Bridge. Okay. But where's a kid going to go on a Saturday afternoon on a bicycle to do a little fishing? There's no place. There is no public access other than a very short stretch adjacent to where Trail Tree Creek comes in, where there's public access where you can take your family and go down for a couple hours to the river and do a little fishing or bird watching or something. This is not there. This at least would provide more public access, which is desperately needed if we want if we want it. I guess a lot of people don't want it, but I do. <laughs> okay. Other concerns? Sir. Well, we do have easements that are working easements that people actually do logging. And I was out there <clears throat> up on Mount Ashland just about a month ago on one of those easements. And so it's well written as the kind of things that we want to do, but 
in working with the Land Conservancy, my concern, one of my deepest concerns over the years, was to maintain the functionality of the ecosystem. And so here we have a person that has an easement and is logging off of that easement and gaining that economic benefit this, that this gentleman talked about that left. And so that's pretty common on a lot of our easements is that what was what was there before in terms of uh, economic viability is still there. The thing that concerns me the most is you, you do it in a fashion that maintains the ecological functionality. And that's what I tried to do most of my career for the Forest Service. And so there have been a lot of changes as we learned how to do that better. But I don't, one of the things that bothers me the most is when people talk about the land as a palace or something stable, it's not going to be stable. And what we have to learn is how to live with it and the changes that take place. And that doesn't mean that you can't do anything extractive. The land is not static, is what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did I see a hand over here? Yes. It's more of a question for you. The stipulations that you give on to them before giving them this grant to ensure the purchase of this property. Does the stipulation give a time frame that they have to hold the property? Is it in perpetuity? Is it three years? Is it five years? Is it four years? Right. Because I understand that the eight hundred thousand dollars set aside to manage property. Well, to me, that looks like four people for a few years at fifty thousand dollars a year. Right. Okay. That's not a long term. And the whole thing that comes by this is by the time 2020 comes along, I see this ending and being donated to the BLM as the Nature Conservancy is trying to do with a parcel down your table box. That we create the wild and scenic. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our program works like this. We don't invest unless it's in perpetuity. And all of the due diligence process that we go through, this is why it takes us a long time to get to a decision point about an application. Uh, we need to make sure that there's going to be capacity to do that stewardship in perpetuity. And typically the way these things are done is that $800,000 you talk about is invested and drawn off of. And so the investment earnings from that pay for the, the uh, stewardship uh, costs in perpetuity. Um, and that, that is a very key piece to what we do. Um, because if the capacity isn't there to do that, then it's not worth our investment. I, I don't think it's what you were saying earlier um, that it's, it actually is public money. Your, your money yes. can go to a lot of things. It I is public heard the governor in a news release yesterday talk about the waste of $100,000 on policing this thing over in Carnegie. Okay. But, and this is a million five. Now I'm looking at the use of state money, money that we put in, either what or how have we have ever done it, it's still a tax bill. We pay money into the lottery by buying it. We understand the money's supposed to help over them. But the, the reality to it here is unless you have another meeting showing the, the actual guidelines of that grant, the stipulations that show that they hold it in perpetuity, then this is this is ridiculous and it's irresponsible to do it. Because in four years, that land could be turned over to someone else in a heartbeat. Or that land will be held, destroyed, and once all of this factor of sustainable development comes around, once it manifests itself, that land is going to be held in a point where all of it will be just destroyed. It's already happened. And I, I look at this and I'm thinking, how can I protect what's here? And I hear a lot of good words. I hear everyone talking, oh man, let's save the land. Let's do this. Let's do this. There's birds that resist it. I've lived here 20 some odd years. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I've looked at it in that way. I've tried to protect everything. I've tried to protect everything involved. But I look ahead how to protect the kids and how to protect the young people coming up to have the time that I've had here. Doing it this way, taking a million five, if I want to go buy a piece of property, nobody took the property that I bought and invested behind me. I did it through my own hard work and effort. And when I look at this here, I'm sure there's enough people in this room that could do it without taking this. This could be used for actual improvement of something. 
everything here becomes, unless a stipulation is included in there, that that is in perpetuity. And I would like to see that because there the is. information that I yes. saw shows that there's a lot of donations sure. after several yeah. years of these. To, to answer your question, uh, whenever we enter into a grant agreement through our program, it has to result in a conservation easement deed that is in perpetuity. So it's not time limited, it doesn't come to an end in five years, ten years. It is in perpetuity, it is recorded. Sure, but that doesn't that doesn't address what I just said. They can donate that land to the DLA. That's the traction of most of these efforts. And any landowner can donate to anyone they want, but sure. our organization will, will hold a conservation easement yeah. in perpetuity yeah. if yeah. if our yeah. if our board yeah. 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 that that's a possibility. But that is not all kind of mumbles. Um, I got spoke earlier uh, from my professional role about the value of this riparian area. I want to take that professional hat off and speak as a river user. Um, 20 years ago, I moved here not as an environmental professional, as a trout bum. Like many of the people in this room, I came here to fish the Rogue River and to be on it, and that's what drew me here. I now own a couple different properties. I pay thousands of dollars in property taxes in this county. And I'm still using this river, and only now I use it with my kids. And when we're floating down this river, uh, we snorkel with Chinook, wild Chinook salmon, spring Chinook. We fish for steelhead, we fish for salmon, we bird watch, we use all these different values. And, you know, just this summer, we stopped in front of the preserve here and snorkeled with uh, wild spring Chinook in a big pool. Doing that kind of activity in front of somebody's mansion or box home is not nearly as inspirational it's not nearly as educational. And honestly, when I get out of the boat, fish, or I'm along the bank, I don't want to be standing in somebody's front yard. I want. I came here for the Wild River Corridor, and I think a lot of people come here every year for exactly that. They spend the money on gas, they spend the money on guides, they spend the money on food, they, they visit our hotels, and it's a revenue source. If we allow the river's corridor to degrade and become developed, so that floating down the river is like taking a bus tour through Beverly Hills. <laughs> Nobody's going to come here. I wouldn't have come here for that. That's right. So are you familiar with the Pat's Anti Flies? I am. Okay. So tell the story of Pat's Anti Flies. How it was sold, and they take it back, and sold, and take it back. And even though it's a wonderful thing, there's still somebody there holding it in the same state it was 20 years ago. I'm going to pause here uh, briefly because we are past our allotted time. I just wanted to make sure that if there was, if there's somebody here who has not had a chance to speak, that you do have a chance before we need to go, if you do need to go. Anybody that hasn't spoken yet? Yes, sir. Uh, the seller's asking price and the buyer's bidding price, what is? what are those two amounts? Um, the appraised value on a, an appraisal from 2014 uh, was $3 million. The asking price is $2.4 million. So there will have to be an updated appraisal. And if there is a difference in those values, the landowner has said they would donate that, that value. So the actual offer will be how much? $2.4 million. Okay. Ma'am. Um, I, I think that it might be useful for people who are not familiar with OWEB's mission, why it was created by the state. It's very specific. It's not for state funding for schools, it's not for a number of things that would be valuable to the, sure. to the citizens. Perhaps you could just briefly sure. clarify the mission. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our mission is to preserve and restore watersheds and natural habitats that support uh, thriving communities and local economies. That's our very brief mission. Uh, the funding for it, as has been mentioned, is through lottery revenue. The constitutional amendment that was discussed earlier um, uh, directed that 7.5% of lottery revenues be d directed to Owen. And so that's what funds our organization uh, and has since 1996. And then there was a second vote in 2010, uh, the referendum vote that Dan referred to uh, made the, the uh, constitutional amendment permanent. Okay, any uh, final comments before we break? Yes. I just, I just wanted to make a comment to a woman um, who was concerned about groups like us going and uh, persuading landowners to want to sell their land to us. Um, we, that's not a strategy that we ever use. 
um, we only work with landowners who voluntarily want to work with us. And in this particular case, these landowners approached us. Um, we did not approach them. So I just want to clarify. Well, I like Thank to Any other final comments before we break? If not, I want to thank you all for coming today. Appreciate your input. And as I said, I will bring this uh, feedback back to our board. And you do have until April 12th if you choose to submit your comments. Thank you all.